Hi, I'm Jenna Flanagan, and I'm the host of the WNET Group's award-winning multi-platform news magazine, Metro Focus. The WNET Group is home to Channel 13, America's flagship PBS station located in New York City. 13 airs Metro Focus seven nights a week. Now, on behalf of everyone here, thank you for joining us for Close to Home, Town Halls on Housing Equality. Each week we're gathering with frontline thinkers and doers to examine an array of complex topics such as housing and economic justice, food sovereignty and security, homelessness and community, cultural displacement, and media narratives about housing. The summit will present frank talk about issues and solutions with an understanding of history and eyes towards the future. Close to Home is taping live every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern from April 26th to May 24th. Learn more at 13.org slash close to home. Tonight's program, The Roots Run Deep, a town hall about culture and displacement, is presented by the WNET Group and Chasing the Dream, our national multi-platform reporting initiative that explores inequality, opportunity, and justice in America. You can watch the programs produced by Chasing the Dream at pbs.org slash chasing the dream or at youtube.com slash on the brink pbs. Please subscribe to all of them. Part of our station's mission is to provide meaningful experiences to our audiences and communities to educate, entertain, and inspire by bringing together leaders who are at the front lines of creating equality. We hope Close to Home will provide new perspectives and ideas for strengthening and enlivening all our communities. We will have time for an audience Q&A towards the end, so as you watch the live stream, please post your questions in the comments section. And please join us again next Wednesday for the closing night of the series, The Bigger Picture, a town hall about journalism and housing narratives. I'd like to thank our promotional partner for tonight's episode of Close to Home. We're grateful for the support of Forge Project. And last, a very special thank you to WNET's 400 plus community partners. Their input has shaped our thinking around this topic and so many others. And a quick reminder that the views expressed by tonight's guests and attendees are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the WNET group. And now I'm pleased to introduce WNET's Director of Community Partnerships, the curator of Close to Home, and tonight's moderator, Brian Tate. Thank you so much, Jenna. Uh, it's always great to hear from you, have you open these programs. I want to begin by paying respect and acknowledging the Lenape people upon whose unceded and ancestral homeland lies the city we call Manhattan. Please join me in making this affirmation from a place of deep respect and humility and solidarity with an ongoing commitment to decolonization and racial justice. I wanna also acknowledge the uh, continuity between our being here tonight and the struggle for liberation and the full expression of our humanity that has transcended generations. Many lives have been lost in that struggle to forces of racism, hate, fascism, greed, and extremism. We hold all those people close and we honor them when we come together across communities to speak truth and create change. I wanna now thank all of you for joining us for week four of Close to Home Town Halls on Housing Equality. It's incredible to think that we're at the fourth week now uh, we've had such phenomenal conversations. Each time we hold these town halls, we begin with a short performance by a gifted musician. Or I'm in Brooklyn, if you don't, if you don't know, hence the, hence the silence. Um, we begin. We begin with a siren. We begin with a short performance by a gifted musician, a spoken word artist, to help gather us across this uh, virtual space and remind us why we have come together to have these tough conversations. And the reason is for the culture. We're thrilled to have with us tonight someone so special uh, uh, to kick off this summit. So please join me in welcoming, without much further ado, White Mountain Apache soloist, musician, composer, and collaborator, and my new friend, Laura Ortman. Hello. Hey. Hey. Great to see you, Laura. Great to see you too. This is great. Do I understand you're at the uh, Williamsburg Music Center tonight? 
Yes, um, we are here amongst a million instruments. Uh, this place has been here 40 years. So I'm really excited to um, um, enjoy the acoustics and the beautiful sunlights coming in. It's so fitting to have you at a place uh, that has been there for 40 years. And this conversation about culture and displacement, uh, we're really thankful to them for hosting you tonight. Um, Laura, what are you going to, uh, wait, before I ask you about your, what you're gonna perform, Tell us where people can see you again after tonight's performance. I'm excited to play um, uh, May 27th uh, up in Hudson, New York at the 24 hour drone festival. Continuous um, sound for 24 hours. And I'll, I'll have an hour's part of that. Oh, wonderful. Uh, as a fan of uh, drone music and just drone in general, I, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and really looking forward to your performance tonight. What will you be playing for us? I've been uh, considering the trajectory of the light across the beautiful waters all around uh, New York City. Um, it's going to be a beautiful sunset tonight. So I'm, I'm uh, playing for all the beautiful eyes that can reflect off the waves of the waters around us. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Everyone, we give you Laura Ortman.
just tremendous. My gosh. Lord, we could listen to that for hours. Thank you so much. Everyone, you can learn more about Laura and her music at the Dust Dive Flash dot bandcamp dot com and we'll drop that into the chat thank you so much laura uh boy super special uh everyone and with the light coming in man that was incredible uh everyone please join me now in welcoming uh tonight's incredible panel for the roots run deep a town hall about culture and displacement you can find everyone's full bios uh at 13.org slash close to home and a direct link should also be, uh, should appear in your chat about now. And remember that the panel will be taking your questions as well. So please post your questions in that same chat. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Najma Abraham, spoken word artist, fashion photographer, educator, and organizer, and the founder of Najma Designs in Brooklyn, New York. Najma. Hey, thank you for having me, Brian. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, we're honored to have you. Thank you. Uh, Jali Brown Cepeda, Afro-Indigenous Dominican archivist and filmmaker, founder and curator, Nuevo Yorkinos, uh, who is joining us from New York City. Jali. Hi, thank you for having me. Excited to be in conversation with everyone today. Awesome. Uh, Candace Hopkins of the Carcross Tagish First Nation, Carcross Tagish First Nation. Uh, the executive director and chief curator of Forge Project, located on the unceded lands of the Mahikane Kane Ak. Did I? Say, it. I oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we're very happy to have you with us tonight. Ronald Moulton, co founder, Don't Mute DC, down in Washington, DC. Ron? Thanks for having me. Great to have you. And last but not least, my friend, Betty Yu, socially engaged multimedia artist, photographer, filmmaker, educator, and activist, and the co-founder of the Chinatown Art Brigade, also joining us from New York City. Betty? Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we're gonna jump right into it. I just wanna remind uh, everyone watching that uh, I have a bunch of questions for these folks. I would love to hear your questions too. So please drop them in the chat where you are. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things to set us up at the top. And, you know, uh, it, it occurred to me, as I mentioned while uh, Laura was performing, that uh, the Williamsburg Music Center, uh, which is located in Williamsburg, it's been there for 40 years. And it's a place that uh, we can call upon and she can call upon to go there and do a performance. Uh, and there's a sense of community and a sense of place and relationships and just how important that is uh, to the conversation that we're having and the experiences that we have and the experiences we want to build uh, in our respective communities. So I just want to lift that up. Uh, here's what I'd like to say at the top. We know from our opening night panel in this series on housing and economic justice that issues of affordable housing and economic disparity are not limited to urban areas and that each community represent here, represented here tonight is impacted. We also know the people on the front lines of experiencing disparity and injustice develop powerful strategic responses to those forces. Artists and culture makers whose practices demand radical ways of understanding and being in the world are perhaps at the forefront of creating moral solutions and strategic solutions to a myriad of social issues. Paradoxically, artists who are often priced out of the communities they've helped enriched are sometimes considered the forerunners of the forces that help push people up. So we're glad to gather with the five of you to discuss these complex issues of culture and displacement. Betty and Ron, uh, help us please understand the situations where you are. You've both co-created powerful organizations and movements to counter the, the displacement of people and homegrown culture. What can you tell us about the social and economic pressures that prompted the creation of the Chinatown Art Brigade and of Don't Mute DC. Betty, would you start us off, please? Sure. Um, thanks again for having me, uh, Brian. And it's it's really um, amazing to be with you all here virtually um, in this roundtable uh, conversation. So Chinatown Art Brigade um, 
you know, we're a fairly young organization, a collective, a cultural collective started in 2015, but we've been working very closely um, with CAV, organizing Asian communities, and um, they um, have a, 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 t a tenants organization within their group um, called Chinatown Tenants Union. And basically they've been organizing in New York City's Chinatown, Manhattan's Chinatown. Um, so I'm, I was born and raised in New York City and I was, uh, you know, raised in the Brooklyn's Chinatown, but, uh, you know, went between and still go between Brooklyn um, and, and Chinatown quite frequently. Um, but um, after 9-11, as folks might know, um, the hardest hit areas were the Lower East Side in Chinatown. Um, a lot of them actually didn't get any uh, relief in terms of uh, health um, the health impact was was dire as well as the economics. And so in Chinatown, we had a, a mix of, you know, my parents who are garment workers as well. A lot of people lost their jobs. Um, people were suffering from the poor air quality. Anyway, so there's a lot happening and no one really wanted to be in Chinatown, right? Of course, there are folks who were frontline workers who were doing relief work. Um, not literally, not just at ground zero, but in general, because there were still a lot of people who just couldn't leave Chinatown. So sort of everything that we're seeing now, all the luxury towers and condos, um, all like you were mentioning, Brian, I think that um, for us, we talk about the systems of gentrification. So how the city sanctions all of this through tax incentives for developers um, and, 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 and really understand how to manipulate and use artists often in certain projects to bring artists in to help raise the property the le property levels, whether they're um, galleries, commercial galleries, or certain amenities for folks of that kind of type of, of that class, of the creative class. And then, and then they know, just like Soho, if you look at Soho from the 80s and 90s, they get priced out, right? And so the same exact thing is happening in Chinatown right now. So everything we're seeing now actually started after 9-11 when these developers got money from the city um, to really land grab. And so what we're seeing is really a result Result of that. And so you have tenants, um, about 90% of the folks that live in Chinatown are actually renters. And a big majority of them are actually elders um, and monolingual Chinese speakers. And so you're talking about affordable housing in the now, uh, you know, the, you know, a lot of, as you probably know, a lot of the housing developer, the developers demand uh, from the city, uh, a small percentage of it be affordable housing. However, um, affordable housing is 85,000 a year for a family of four. And the average uh, income for a family of four in Chinatown is not even 35,000 a year. So you know who that's targeting. So uh, we've been doing um, a lot of cultural organizing work with tenants. And um, I can talk a little bit more about it later, but basically we started basically, um, you know, amplifying their stories through evening projections on walls at night. Um, and that started a really a, a conversation, right? Ta so, so it's really taking it out of the white box, right? I mean, I think that tenants, we really took the lead from tenants who said, you know what, if we want to reach other everyday working class folks, tenants, it's out in the streets because they're working 12, 14 hours a day. Um, and we want to reach them as they're coming out of the subway and this kind of thing. So we went through did cultural storytelling workshops with them through uh, uh, walking tours that tenants led, mapping right. out places that are no longer there. We call them re uh, sites of resilience or resistance. And, and then we did some photography and some other community mapping. And those resulted in these projections that we did a series of them in Chinatown. Um, and they really have um, been amazing. And a lot of people say, well, then what, right? But we've really elevated their stories. And as a result, have connected people toward the organization and uh, have helped uh, elevate um, the organizing itself, um, and um, you know, sadly, I'll talk a little bit about it la later. Sadly, there are the largest towers are going up in Chinatown, as well as the biggest, biggest and largest jail in the world is being built in Chinatown. Hold so that, the hold fight that. is still happening. I want to stop there. I'll stop there. <laughs> no, no, no. That's 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 powerful stuff, and there's so much of it is a great segue over to Ron. I just want to say we're going to come back around to a couple of things that you brought up about the work that you all are doing and why you're doing it. Uh, and thank you so much for starting us off with that understanding of the situation in Chinatown. Um, and it's, that it's something that goes back some years and undoubtedly some years before that. Uh, Ron, can you tell us about um, uh, the situation on the ground that prompted the creation of Don't Mute DC? And yes. just what, what the conditions were like for folks? Yeah, so four years ago, um, gentrifiers who normally move into urban communities, they come in and they see the culture, the music and everything that goes on. And we've experienced this 
throughout DC and other urban communities, even if you go to Africa, the same thing goes on in, in communities like uh, in Paso Lagos, right? The people come in and try to strip the culture. Um, uh, so we had this corner uh, where uh, Don Campbell, who was a, a guy who had a store where he sold cell phones and played go-go music for over 25 years on the corner, right down the street from Howard University. Uh, Gentrify moves in uh, at this high-rise apartment building across the street called The Shea, and basically said they didn't want the music there anymore. They couldn't convince DC government officials to do anything, so they reached out to uh, T-Mobile. And T-Mobile were threatening to take this guy's contract, which was the basic source of his income because he sold thousands of phones every, every month and had thousands of clients from Howard University and that community. So uh, he called me um, and I called my partner, Natalie Hawkinson, who I was already working on, uh, gentrifiers coming in and threatening black businesses uh, already. So we were kind of, you know, pissed off. So we came together, we did a petition and we did a petition that got 80, 000, over 87,000 signatures, 40,000 from our area, but another 30,000 plus from around the country. And most of the people are saying, this is happening in my community, you know? Uh, and, and what is happening is people are coming in, they're pushing the, the people who were there when nobody wanted to be there out. And they're pricing us out, they're stripping us of our culture or stealing our culture. And the people just, it was a spot that turned into a movement. And from that movement, um, you know, I tell people all the time, the squeaking wheel, you know, gets the oil, right? And most of the time, most people in these poor communities or even middle class communities don't have time to organize and fight back. So you have a small group of people who always benefit from organizing, getting what they want when the majority of the people of our city, which is 47 percent African-American, get the least. So we kept pushing even after we got the music cut back on um, for policy uh, that, that addresses equity. Like people can do all the feel good stuff, but we're not talking about equity, we're not talking about anything. So uh, Councilman McDuffie actually uh, pushed policy that made Go-Go DC's official music. That was the music that they tried to mute. We also pushed policy that uh, with him and administration and the council that gave money to, to black people to buy their properties, all right, for black people to start restaurants and businesses. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to, to people who normally can't get a loan because of the redlining and all the other things that go on in our communities that stop people with great talent and great ideas from living the American dream that everybody always talked about. So that's what our movement has been about. And we've used the social power or the superpower of music and culture, not only to, to, to entertain people and to give our people, you know, like energy, right, to fight back, but it's also been a tool to educate people because mm -hmm. Most of the time, our people fall short of, of being activated because they don't know how. They don't know how, why, and what they can do. And they don't know a lot of things that are happening uh, to them until after it's done. So these are some of the things, in short, uh, that we're doing along with the things that we're doing in Anacostia with uh, you know, former gang members I work with that own these properties over here with me that the government actually gave us $2 million to buy, right? So you got young former gang members' names on deeds and like a lot of people think that that's something but that's nothing when 90 uh the study that was just done uh, in washington dc the spurity study showed that 92 percent of all property and land given away in washington dc was given to white men 92 percent and we're 42 percent of the population 92 percent of the contracts that were given away or given or earned or whatever in washington dc went to white men but we're 47 percent of the population. So these are the things that moving forward that we will continue to address uh, as we address all the other issues that impact arts, culture, music and everybody living the American dream, as people must uh, often say. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank you so much. That's a great segue. I want to go to Candace and Jolly and Jolly now. Um, your organizations do amazing work that is grounded in the present moment while looking forward and looking back to lift up indigenous futures, legacies, and identity. Can you tell us how cultural erasure fits into this discussion of displacement and why the work of Forge Project and Nuevo Yorkinos is so essential to community empowerment? Candace, would you start us please? 
Thanks, Brian. And thanks to my colleagues for such invigorating work. From our perspective at Forge, we are a native-led organization. We're located um, along the banks of the Mahikonatuk River. And I say that because I think it's time to shelve Henry Hudson's name. You know, he wasn't the first person to name that river. It was named by the Mohikaniak people, among many others, because it's the river that flows both ways. You know, it's such a powerful waterway that it can shift its direction. Um, so I recognize as the executive director of Forge that I am a guest on Mohikaniak land, on Mohican land. So the displacement of Mohican people, and I'm not speaking on their behalf, I'm simply telling some historical facts, started in the 1700s. So from our perspective, <laughs> gentrification and displacement are both the tools and techniques of colonialism. I think it's sometimes too simple to think uh, that colonialism doesn't work hand in hand with capitalism, that gentrification obviously is a form of speculation. It can be a form of um, speculative capital. However, the forms of it and the roots of it go very deep, particularly in these lands, particularly on the East Coast. So part of what we try to do at Forge is to put these things within historical perspective, because we feel that by understanding the history of displacement, we can understand how it operates and start to dismantle it from those perspectives. One of the concerns that we have at Forge Project is that through this kind of radical displacement, it's created a real vacuum. So a lack of knowledge of indigenous peoples who inhabit and have inhabited that land and also shape its future. Oftentimes native folks are spoke of in past tense, particularly in this part of the world, because you know the displacement was not simply displacement, it was violent, you know, people died, there were genocides. Um, I think it's really important to understand it within that context, but also a kind of provocation. So what we did at Forge most recently, uh, together with uh, many, many colleagues, people working in the area, and direct action, um, people working in the area to think about how, you know, the prison industrial complex is also a kind of form of gentrification as well as displacement. Um, from our perspective, gentrification is colonialism. And we say that because we are trying to be provocative about that. One of the reasons that we try to talk about that so much and foreground that is because how then, if we don't understand that, how then can we work towards indigenous place making? So part of our mission at Forge is to think about how can we be accessible as we have a residency program, a fellowship program, we run indigenous programs for indigenous people, not just to educate outsiders, but although that happens too, how can we work together to bring people back to their homelands? There's so many barriers for people to return to their homelands, including Lenape folks on Manhattan Island. And one of those barriers is cost. Another barrier is deep lack of knowledge. Another barrier is many people on the East Coast have been reduced to the violence of stereotype. Thank you, Candace. Uh, so much to so much to build on from there. Uh, Jolly. Um, Jolly, would you also give us your response about uh, how cultural erasure fits into this discussion of displacement and uh, why the work of Nuevo Yokinos is so essential to community empowerment? Absolutely. Um, again, thank you for having me. And I am a deep fan of the work that the Chinatown Arts Brigade and Don't Mute DC have been doing. So I, and now learning about the Forge Project, I'm in gratitude to be able to speak with everyone. Nueva Yorkinos is a project that me and my partner um, in love and life, we run. It's a archive multimedia project dedicated to documenting and preserving New York City's Latino and cultural history um, and our present through family photos and stories. And we accept photos and videos taken within the five boroughs of New York City. Um, people must be of Latin American and or Caribbean um, backgrounds, diasporas, 
And um, yeah, the photos are taken within the five boroughs. And the way or the reason why we do this work um, is both of us are New Yorkers, similar to what was said about D.C., similar to what's said about Chinatown, similar to what's been said about um, just the East Coast in general, um, the Nape Hoking in particular, um, and urban centers is that gentrification is colonialism. And what does that look like? You know, it looks like the fact that the Latina, you know, mother who's been running a shop for 50 years where they are, you know, uh, where they fix shoes, like can no longer exist, right? She's priced out. It, it means that elders in our communities aren't able to, or are now rather victims of, you know, tenant abuse, um, of, of tenant mistrust. I've been dealing with this specifically with my grandparents because, you know, living in being from a neighborhood that's gentrifying, um, they're trying to push everyone out. You know, it's, it's really, I want to echo what Candace is saying, you know, gentrification is very violent. Gentrification is something that completely reorients someone's connection to an existence within their community where I'm from. So I have a lot of different roots in New York city. I was raised in Zeichman, upper Manhattan. I also have family from uh, my father's family is from the South Bronx where I was also raised. I've lived in Brooklyn. Um, I've lived in Queens and seeing my communities, seeing our communities as black, brown, immigrant, New Yorkers change and us not being able to participate in that change and us being pushed out because of that change is something that is violent. I have friends who have had to seek help, you know, through therapy because of the psychological effects of displacement, you know, um, not having that community that was once there, having, you know, the neighborhood that I grew up in of Upper Manhattan at a certain point a couple of years ago, maybe five or so years ago, um, we received the most 311 calls in the whole entirety of New York City. Why? Because gentrifiers were calling the cops on us saying, oh, they're shooting outside. We're not shooting. We're playing dominoes. Oh, there's a fight outside. We just talk like this. You know, we come from a community where we're talking to our neighbors over there. And what is that? That's that's indigenous memory. That's African memory. That's the way that we are able to show up for ourselves, our ancestors, our cultures, our communities. Our neighborhoods as black and brown enclaves are places where we've been able to plant our flags. They're places where we are able to create networks for folks who are either, you know, um, immigrants themselves, first generation, second generation, um, or migrated, you know, from different parts of uh, the country. And so the work that we're doing, um, particularly on Instagram, when you see the page and you see each post, we're showing, oh, this photo was taken in 1980s Williamsburg. And what does that look like? That was Los Sures. That is, you know, uh, Black, Puerto Rican, and Dominican. That's not the, the Williamsburg of, of today where, you know, a coffee is $10. Um, it's very important, like Candace said, it's so important to stress the violence that comes with gentrification because we are not meant or we are not, we, we're not meant to participate in, in these shifting landscapes of our communities that we've built for generations, you know? And so through centering families, through centering family stories, family videos, by centering New York City as a character of herself and as a place that is so, you know, New York is nothing without Black and immigrants, pe communities, peoples, diasporas. And unfortunately, the whitewashing that, again, has been going on since 1492, um, we're seeing it again today. We're seeing it, you know, um, in Los Sures. We're seeing it in Bed-Stuy, where 22,000 Black residents you know, we're, we're, we're displaced within the past decade. We're seeing it in Washington Heights. We're seeing it on the East River with all the luxury developments being built, again, through affordable housing, but affordable to whom? Not right. me, no one I know, no one right. in my family. So, you know, this work, again, like I'm, I'm chuckling, but it, it's very violent. And so the reason why we do what we do is to make sure that our flag maintains where it is as black, brown immigrant communities and that we're able to main, exist here. We, we shouldn't have to leave, you know? Um, so yeah, I I can go on as all of us okay. can. No, we're so that's, passionate. That's, that's, that's great stuff, Charlie, I appreciate yeah. it. Najma, uh, I wanna bring you into the conversation and I'm realizing that um, I actually have three questions for you. <laughs> so yes. 
like right now I have three questions for you. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to boil it down uh, okay. because I want to pick up on something that Candace mentioned uh, in her response about uh, policing and incarceration. But before I come to that, uh, let's just stay in the lane that we're in where Candace and Jali were talking about um, uh, the work of cultural narrative. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can just tell us, uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, the project that you created, I Am More Than a Scarf, and then I will dive into the, the question I wanted to ask you after that. So, um, so with that project and um, a couple of other projects that are connected to that project, it's just the fact that dealing with intersectionality, sometimes um, people don't have the, I guess, the capacity to understand that I am Muslim, Black, and a woman, and how do they all relate to me. Every Each one of those are relevant to my story. So um, with our More Than a Scarf, it just mainly the fact that as a Muslim woman, people just tend to see your hijab or see your scarf and we're visual all the time. So we're representation of our faith, but they don't know what is she thinking? What, it, what What's going on in her world? What's going on with her education, her family, the things that she feels. So um, for example, um, there was an interview with, um, who is it, um, Huda Katabi. She did an interview and they were talking to her about her book and someone asked her, um, instead of talking about the book, they're asking her, so what do you think about terrorism and guns and war in America? And you sound very un-American. So we tend to get asked the questions about terrorism versus things that actually affect me in my community every single day as, as a black woman, as a Muslim woman, you know, um, walking the streets. So, um, so I think just being able to have a place where we tell our stories, we tell our narratives, we talk about how each thing impacts us from every perspective, me being raised in Brooklyn from a Caribbean, you know, family that, you know, that impacts me. And I see that differently than, uh, you know, a Muslim that was um, an immigrant that came to this country from somewhere else. So it's just like being able to say we are not a monolith and our stories are layered and we have to be able to tell them so they exist and they live. And, and we also just do it for the culture, for the love. And, mm. you know, love to me is a revolutionary act. We're out here mm. loving, we're showing our community, showing how we love, how we um, build as our families. And, and a lot of these stories get lost because from generation to generation, we're kind of losing the oral traditions. So just kind of even going back to these oral traditions of being able to share these stories through song, through through uh, music, through photography, through writing, I think is so important. So I myself as a spoken word artist, as well as a photographer, I really wanna take all of these mediums and put them, put them together and tell that story. Right, right, thank you. Thank you, Najma. Uh, so let me use that as uh, to lead into the question that I was about to ask you, uh, Najma. Uh, and Betty, I'm gonna bring you back in now too. So Najma, in 2020, you were one of three black Muslim women who co-organized the march from Bay Ridge to the Barclays Center, titled mm -hmm. Muslims Against Police Brutality. Among other accomplishments, the march disrupted, disrupted mainstream narratives about the concerns of Muslim Americans. And I wanna come back to that as you brought up just a moment ago about uh, the everyday concerns of Muslim Americans here in New York City and elsewhere. But first I'd like to ask you and Betty, from your work as educators and organizers and artists, what do you see as the relationship between policing, incarceration, and gentrification? Oh, God. <laughs> how, how, are, how are those forces impacting young people, families, people on the ground where you are? Najma, would you start? And then uh, Betty oh, will go man. ahead. Um, so I want to say, I mean, traditionally, it, it's such an impact. Like, oh, God, that's a loaded question. But I'm going to mm -hmm. say they, they work hand in hand. Um, we can't sit here and act like, you know, there, there was not a system in place for slave catching. We can't sit here and act like, you know, there wasn't um, a, a whole entire way that we displace people through, you know, redlining. So there's just so much going on in our communities that for years and years and years, this has been the status quo. This has been the system. And I watch when I deal with uh, my youth, I've worked at Rikers, I've worked at youth detention centers. I currently am a counselor at a center for homeless youth. So um, I see the impact every single day of how that school to prison pipeline is set up and it works. It, it's, it's functioning. We can't say it's dysfunctional because it works the way it's meant to work. So um, it's impacting us greatly, or it's impacting our youth greatly. And um, 
every day as I work in the system, I just see how, um, for example, when you stop a youth in the street, a black youth, they are identified as being adults, right? So T Tamar Rice, for example. But when we are looking at a 22 year old that, you know, white boy, you know, oh, they're just a group of kids. You know, they did something wrong. They're not looked at as being youthful. So when a black youth is, his youth is taking away from him at such a young age and he's looking at as a predator or a threat, you know, that happens in the school system. Then the schools are now calling the police. Then the police are now, you know, enforcing this, you know, this structure over and over again. So I feel like, we, we have to talk about like the structure in place that makes black youth a threat. And it starts in the schools, it starts in the system and it starts in your neighborhood. Right, thank you. Thank you, Najma. Uh, Betty, can you tell us your thoughts about how policing, incarceration and gentrification uh, are intersecting in Chinatown? Yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, we all know that incarceration, gentrification, policing, all are tools that, uh, under that that help make capitalism function right like it's it's, it's structural we all know that um but i think that to to bring out the nuance of it in chinatown the system has really weaponized um i think and pit uh black and brown folks against asian folks in so many different ways right and if we know our history we look back at the 60s and the 70s in particular there is a strong history of black and asian solidarity right i mean the, you know, sort of um, the Asian American movement really um, took its inspiration from the civil rights struggles of the 60s, right? So we have to, you know, remind ourselves of the solidarity and of the long struggles that we've had in, in supporting one another. And I say that because of, of, of sort of the ground zero of, of all these issues right now in Chinatown. And so you have um, the city, so the previous mayor who was quote unquote a progressive mayor, Mayor de Blasio, uh, in the guise of, you know, uh, under the guise of closing Rikers, right, we know one of the, the worst jails in the country, in the guise of that, decided to open up four new borough-based jails, right, minus Staten Island. And Chinatown is the site of the, uh, of the Manhattan one. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Eric Adams is continuing, Mayor Eric Adams is continuing uh, this plan, the plan. And it's, $8.3 billion that the city is putting in to build a jail scraper. So they are touting this as the largest jail in the world, right? It's going to be the tallest jail in the world. Um, and so, um, you know, the same communities that are, are, are have, you know, someone was talking about redlining policies, right? That are divesting from our communities um, are the same um, communities that are, um, are, uh, you know, the divesting from our communities are the same communities that are under attack and are being displaced and, and being victims, are victims of gentrification and displacement, right? And so um, we have to understand that the city, right, is going to, the city, take New York City, for example, is going to put upwards of $10 billion to build these jails. That's just for Chinatown. So we're talking about $20 billion for four, four jails. Instead of putting money, right, into um, the programs, right, that we all know can actually uplift people from poverty, right, around education and housing um, and, and, and living wage jobs, right? But instead, it's lining developers' pockets with money, right, on both ends, on building the jail, right, because of, of, of the construction companies and the developers, the private developers who are getting the contract to what's happening on the other side by the river, by the East River, which is going to be the, is the tallest condos in New York City at the edge of Lower East Side Chinatown, right? And so these are the same forces um, that are working together. And these are the same forces as we know, where the city has basically sanctioned vigilantism and people like Daniel Penny, who basically murdered Jordan Neely, right? So these are the same systems in place that are, are giving, literally lining developers' pockets, right, to build these jails and to, to build these luxury towers and to violently displace people instead of actually giving us what we need in our communities to thrive and flourish. Um, and so I just wanted to point out one example in terms of cultural sure. erasure. Um, and the irony of it is that the Museum of Chinese in America, you may have heard of this, because especially in the local New York City folks, back in 2018, um, the local city council person who is Chinese American, but mine is basically a sellout, right? She's not in office anymore. And the Lower, lower East Side said, well, you're going to come and build the jail in Chinatown. Give us something back. So she negotiated some, some money back to the Museum of Chinese in America. And they basically 
uh, basically taking a bribe, I call it, they took $35 million in return for their blessing for this jail. So they call it a community concession um, and a jail will be built. Now, even more dystopic than that is the museum was supposed to be on the ground floor of this jail, which is just beyond me. And so now, but it turns out they're gonna use the money to buy their own uh, space. Um, and in our name, right? I mean, uh, the Museum of Chinese in America, when they started 45 years ago, it was meant to um, highlight the struggles of working class Chinese Americans and Asians right throughout this country. And now it's taking this blood money that it, with, to build a jail that will be right next to their museum. And so they have to absolutely be called out because this is not our history. This does not honor the history of solidarity movements amongst folks of color uh, and, and Asian Americans. My fear is that um, you know the, the Asians are, are being seen as sort of the white ascenders, right? But in actuality, uh, the, 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 the income equality is still the largest, the lar largest income equality exists within the Asian community, if that makes any sense. And again, yeah. you look at the Chinatowns, you look at the working class poor folks um, in the Asian communities living alongside black and brown folks, right? But the narrative, the dominant narrative, they try to pit us against each other. And we have to continue to remember that we have much more in common than differences. And so sadly, you've got a lot of right wing, you've got a lot of Trumpy, you know, Asian American folks out there who are the NIMBY folks, right? They don't want the jail, but they also don't want the shelter, right? The, sh the shelters in their in their backyard, right? And so they're really buying into this kind of narrative. And um, I just have to say that there's still time to try to fight the jail because there was a, a, a fight to actually stop demolition because they're trying to uh, tear down an existing detention center and, bring, and build this tallest 40 story jail, again, tallest jail um, in the world um, yeah. that they wanna build. So those are issues are just completely intersected. There's no way of avoiding it, you know, so. Thank you, Betty. Uh, you uh, have set up some things. Uh, Ron and Candace, um, I'm looking at two different questions I have for the two of you. And it's, it's it, Betty has touched on so many things that I could really go in either direction here. Uh, I think I'm gonna uh, stay in the discussion about arts and culture. So Ron and Candace, uh, the, mu the musical and artistic expressions of people and indigenous people have historically been regarded as commodities, they bought and sold or appropriated and discarded. When corporations and institutions benefit from black and indigenous cultural genius, what responsibilities do they have to the artists and the communities that produce that work? Ron, would you, uh, would you start us on that one? Well, uh... I'm happy to be a Washingtonian where um, we have our music that we created. And it's pretty much to me, the only music that has not been colonized. Uh, therefore, our music has been our superpower. Um, and our, our music and culture has also been what kept DC alive when nobody wanted to be here. Uh, Ben's Chili Bowl, for instance, people will leave the Go-Go's and go to Ben's Chili Bowl after the Go-Go's and all the other restaurants and stuff that were here that paid the taxes, that kept the city moving. You know, we were the backbone of the city. You know, Go-Go music, our arts, our culture, uh, our, our, our designers uh, who Puff Daddy followed uh, when he was at Howard University and learned the whole, whole game of urban clothing, the madness shop. So I, I feel like like a lot is owed to the artists, a lot is owed to the, the culture and the music and corporate people come in and it's not always a good blessing because they pimp us, they steal from us and then they try to sell us back to us, <laughs> right? And that's what we're fighting in Washington, D.C. We don't need people coming here and taking our talents, our music, our culture, our history and then trying to sell it back to us. And a lot of the stuff that happened for instance, after the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, most of us knew there was gonna come a time when all that ran out. You know, all of us have to pull a little black people, right? So now let's get to the real business of sustaining equity, right, for the artists, equity for the musicians. And the corporations owe us that. But it's also about educating the people. Like everything that we do, we never do an event without educating the people, right? And as far as I'm concerned, in many cases, there's no dif difference from a very progressive person and a very conservative person. 
when you get down to the roots of it, they all discriminate against people of color. We always end up getting the same thing. There's no way as, 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 as I'm sorry, progressive as Washington, D.C. is, right? And people in arts and music, uh, we had a budget from the uh, Commission of Arts and Humanities with $34 million was put up every year. And 30% of it went to rich white organizations that have all these endowments and everything. And a, a small fraction of it went to people east of the river where we at right now, where I'm at right now, right? And these are things that happen from the government side to the corporate side, right? And, and, and th we are owed uh, better uh, treatment and we have to continue to fight for it and educate people. And I think the biggest sin that corporations, government, and people who try to help us that they've done to us, when they convince the people in the community the artists, the, 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 the natives, right? That they no longer have power. Mm -hmm. When you get people to thinking that they no longer have power, the war is over, they won. And that's why these movements and these sparks that we have, like Don't Mute DC and, and these what these sisters have done, when we fight back and win, all it takes is a couple of victories, which normally come from the cultural and, and music part of our, 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 our communities, right? The pushback, same thing that happened in the civil rights movement and any movement you've ever seen, the culture and the movement is right in the center of it, right? And we are the, are the vehicle to teach people and demand that these corporations, right, demand that these politicians do right by us, no matter whether they're on the left or the right, because like I told you the other day, what I found in doing this work, right, I don't care what your party is, what your color is or anything, just work with good people. There are good people everywhere. I have Republicans, Republicans helping gay children in Washington, D.C., all right? So don't tell me it ain't no good people everywhere. Find good people, right? Line, line up with them, get Lincoln with them, and make them do right by us, whether they're in corporations, whether they're in government, or whether they're in our community. And if they're not good people, we got to move them out of the way. Thank you, Ron. Thank you so much. Candace. would you uh, give us your thoughts on the responsibilities that corporations and institutions and government have to uh, uh, black and indigenous artists and communities. Yeah, absolutely. Ronald, you're kind of getting me fired up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, one, I'll say, why are most people in the United States more comfortable with us being your mascot than supporting us in real life? That's number one, right? And why did a certain Washington football team make the argument that it was too expensive to change their name while still acknowledging the violence of their name? They finally changed it, but it took a lot. Number two, you know, answering your question, Brian, um, those who benefit from what you term indigenous cultural genius a lot of those folks benefit from what I call our heritage, which they have transformed into trafficable objects that monetarily benefit only them because they're sold at auction. They're sold on the, on the secondary market. They benefit collectors directly and they steal from us and they monetize it and they create speculative futures upon our backs and upon creating a narrative that's based on still the idea that we are a vanishing race. So that's, I think, some of the fundamental um, ideas that you know, we deal with on a daily basis as Native folks. Um, I'd say also simply, you know, think about whose land you're on, find ways of acknowledging not just that history, but find ways of thinking about how you in your daily life can enable indigenous placemaking. That's a political act, but it also enables our collective futures. It also enables our solidarity, our abilities to work intersectionally. There's an amazing collective of artists called New Red Order, and um, they have a slogan. They did, had an incredible exhibition last year at Artist Space here in New York, and their slogan is simply give it back. You know, and they've also renamed land acknowledgements to territorial acknowledgements. Mm. Land can be, as a term, apolitical, 
territorial says, hey, you know, someone had a claim to this at one point in time. So what are you doing to acknowledge that? I also think that with territorial acknowledgements, they're almost like a declaration of treaty. What are your treaty relationships with living native people now? You're not just acknowledging people who used to live here. You're acknowledging your present relations with native people now. For me, that might be the beginnings of what we might consider for native folks to be forms of reparations. But first, you know, for those of us who were displaced from land, particularly Mohican folks who, whose land I am a guest on now, who are displaced all the way to Stockbridge Muncie community in Wisconsin, where they were given land in a shared relationship with Menominee people, thinking about um, giving it back thinking about how that might also be a form of repatriation. These are all real things for us. They're, you know, Eve Tuck and um, C. Wang once said, decolonization is not a metaphor. So we need to work towards making all of these things actionable. I think that, you know, I'm really interested in stopping that cycle of profit of profit of our heritage, our histories, and also our futures. Mm. Mm. Wow, a lot of power there. Thank you both, thank you both. I'm looking at the clock. I think we have maybe 15 minutes uh, uh, and I'm looking at my stack of questions here. So I'm gonna try to go through as many of them as I can. Uh, and the audience, uh, if you have questions, please drop them into the chat. Um, I could listen and speak with these folks all night, but would love to hear your questions too. Um, Jolly, Jolly, you've talked about the importance of showing up for all the intersecting racial and ethnic identities that make up who you are. And Najma, you touched on that uh, a bit ago in your response. I think many people across New York City uh, and frankly uh, throughout the country can relate to the notion that we each contain multitudes of lineage. I'd like to ask you both to please tell us, how can a sense of belonging to multiple communities help to strengthen people in places that are historically marginalized? Jolly, would you uh, respond there please first? Absolutely. Um, before doing so, I wanted to bring up two just bullet points as it relates to incarceration, policing and gentrification. I think we have to acknowledge in immigrant communities, no matter one's background, um, the fear that has come more recently with ICE, with, with the presence of ICE and with the rampant vilification of street vendors who are doing nothing but participating in communities and in um, you know economies rather that we've been doing um, for generations, whether here or back home, wherever home may be. Um, and then secondly, as it pertains to um, you know, folks extracting our majesty, um, I think we need to look at, you know, hip hop and what has the Bronx, Queen, I'm going to look, I'm going to center really quickly just the Bronx, the South Bronx, and then Queensbridge, right? These places, these, these geographies, the people within these housing projects, within these blocks, within these zip codes have given so much since 1973. And what has what have brands, what have corporations, whether it's fashion corporations, whether it's museums, we're now just having the Universal Hip Hop Museum be constructed um, and hopefully the affordable housing that um, is going to be part of that structure is actually affordable, um, unlike the majority of the housing structures that are lining the East River. Um, but you know, like, why is it that Queensbridge is still where Queensbridge is at? Why is it still that the Bronx is where the Bronx is at despite again, being such incredible um, places of cultural um, genius. And so uh, just wanted to bring those up. And in terms of, you know, um, acknowledging all of my identities and how that strengthens me as a person, you know, I, I always have <laughs> like a, a interesting time with answering the who are you? Where are you from? I'm like, I'm a New Yorker, uh, first and foremost, but I'm also Caribbean. I'm also from the island of Quisqueya, of Haiti and Dominican Republic. I'm from an island where we have a legacy of having one of only two female caciques or chieftains within the whole Taino uh, dynasty empire, right? Um, I'm from the, the lands of Anacaona and I'm from the lands of Fat Joe. You know, I'm from uh, 
the Bronx and I'm from Dykeman. I am black, I am Caribbean, I am Afro-Native on my father's side. My grandmother is Powhatan and Anakot Lani Lenape from the Delmarva Peninsula. And, you know, she's very important um, to, to bring up my, my paternal grandmother because she was one of the um, most vocal people in my life and my upbringing, and she still is, who taught me the importance of acknowledging both of my identities that came from, from her side. You know, she was, like, very big on teaching me about our Afro-Native histories. I grew up going to powwows. I grew up a jingle dress dancer, um, if there are any Native folk who know what that is. I grew up, you know, going to reservations with my grandmother. We grew up with a map of the of Turtle Islands of the United States with, you know, different territories and different nations being acknowledged and where they, they were before the Trail of Tears. Um, and so it's just... It's made me personally, and I think it makes everybody, because um, we're all intersectional, um, it makes us walk through this world with an armor that nobody can take away from us. I walk through life and I, I walk with the ancestors, you know, next to me, in front of me, behind me, um, to, you know, speak about what, what uh, Najma was talking about as a Muslim woman. I'm not Muslim, I'm Lukumi. I'm a priestess within the Lukumi Joruba um, a faith uh, emanating from Cuba by way of obviously Dahomey, Yoruba land, Nigeria. Um, and as such, you know, I'm walking with those ancestors too. Um, I feel that when, when we acknowledge the intersectionality of our identities and stand in that power, all it does is, you know, strengthen who we are and, and strengthen what we can bring to our communities, whether they're within the household, within our blocks, within our neighborhoods and within, um, our networks. Got it. Thank you. Najma, could you also take up this question about uh, uh, intersecting and multiple identities and how that can be a force to strengthen communities? And yes, um, absolutely. I think that um, there's sometimes this concept of like, there can only be one. <laughs> like you, you have to, if I am like visibly, you know, black or vis visibly whatever, I have to only represent that. And, the, and sometimes there's this idea any, when erasure happens that you can only be one. And, um, you know, for the people, for all the people, like we have to get to a point where we're like, no, we are all, we are everything. And we have to make it a point that what does a blank look like? You don't get to say that, you know? And um, the more we come out with the intersectionality, the multiple communities that we represent, the more we speak those stories into existence, the more we talk about that. You talked about your ancestors, you know, be, um, being from like, even from Yoruba, then I, you know, I have that in my, in my culture with my Caribbean side, but then I also was born and raised Catholic and then converted to Islam 20 something years ago. So I have like a multitude of history, a multitude of ancestors, a multitude of stories to pull from. And I can't just be the token Muslim or the token black person today. I have to encompass all of it at all times because all of it is relevant to my story. And if I take one piece away, it's no longer my narrative. Hmm. Then secondly, um, the other thing is let people tell their own stories. <laughs> so when we look at stories, you know, in books and Hollywood and stuff, there's a lot of producers and writers that are writing the story for you. And they're not even a part of that. They're not a part of that culture. They're not a part of that faith. They're not a part of that religion. They're not a part of it. But they're writing and co-opting these stories and then putting token people in its place to kind of be the, the front person that tells those stories. So we need to actually have a lot more creators and artists being, you know, able to tell their stories where their stories are not being co-opted and, and whitewashed or erased and told in a narrative that's comfortable. It needs to get very uncomfortable. And, and we need to start really taking control of those stories and being able to say them as wide as we can across all of the diasporas. Thank you so much, Najma. Uh, I'm getting a note here. We have five minutes before going to audience Q&A. Uh, let me ask, uh, let's see here. I'm going to ask one more question, I think, and see if where that takes us. Uh, Betty, there's a statement on the Chinatown Art Brigade's website that reads, there is no conversation to be had about gentrification and displacement without acknowledging that we are settlers on occupied Lene Lenape land. Hmm. And Candace, as you mentioned, Forge uh, Project recently organized a program titled Gentrification is Colonialism. 
I'm struck that both your organizations are centered around artists while also engaging with residents and people across sectors. Can you tell us how networks of artists can uniquely help build equitable decolonized communities and why you feel they should be engaged in that work? Betty? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> I'll, I will try to address it or I'll, 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 um, I'm trying to think how I can come at this. Well, first I wanted to, to address the statement you just read. Um, and um, thank you so much, Candace, for uh, uplifting the, the, it's not, it's not slight, it's big, right? To say territorial as opposed to land acknowledgement. And I think that that's like something that I'm sitting with. Um, and I think for, for a lot of us who do this work, um, speaking of bringing our multiple, uh, you know, wearing our multiple hats and, and coming as a, a full human beings in a holistic way to this work. Um, I think a lot of us who are cultural workers and artists um, and a lot of us who've, ha who have, you know, um, experience our own trauma, right? Where our family has been uprooted from wherever they came from and then had to, were forced to the US, even if they didn't want to be, as we know, um, enslaved people who are the, have been the most impacted by that, right? In terms of literally being forced, um, forced onto, onto to US soil. Um, and so um, for us, um, we grapple a lot with this, it, these issues around gentrification and displacement. Um, and really, it, how do we center um, a, a specifically in New York, Lene Lenape Ho King, um, who are have been the most dispossessed, right? Violently stripped, um, it, you know, uh, of their land. And, and so, you know, it's, it's one of these kind of conversations that is really important for us to bring to folks in Chinatown, to tenants, because I often think that for, for them, um, some of them who have come uh, much later in life, uh, a political education is really important to understand how these con c these issues are connected, intimately connected, um, that the same forces, you know, that colonized um, this land and, and the forces now, these corporations, these developers um, are, are, are part of this, are the same, are the same forces, right? And so I just wanted to say that that's really important for us. And that's a constant conversation that we're having amongst ourselves and with older tenants in Chinatown and to constantly center that. So what does that mean? Right. And how do we center that? And so we've worked with a lot of different organizations. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, right before the pandemic, housed a uh, uh, housed, uh, hosted a dinner discussion with the American Indian Community House, uh, decolonized this place and a bunch of other folks who are doing work. Um, folks in Bushwick, Mikasa, Noa Sukasa, um, a bunch of folks who are doing this work and understanding centering um the indigenous resistance, but how do we actually do that? And I'm so interested in continuing this conversation. Mm. But it, um, you know, I want to say, and I don't know, I'm, I'm going to take this second just to like kind of answer your questions kind of in a different way, which is that people who we think are our allies in Chinatown, artists, you, you know, and folks who are second, third generation, um, are actually not. They're the ones actually exploiting our, our community. They're the ones actually tr uh, trying to. Um, you know, use the exotic, co-opting the exotification, the Orientalism of Chinatown, right, for the tourist community, for the for the tourists, right, that are coming to visit Chinatown. And so I think, you know, race is important, but economics is really important. So we're, I'm talking about people who made Chinatown what it is, right, all of our communities in Chinatown 140 years ago, right? They have third, fourth generation Chinese Americans who are coming back and saying, we don't want the poor working class immigrant families to come and buy our bubble tea who's going to come and buy the bubble tea it's the tourists and the richer asians who can pay eight dollars to buy the bubble tea so i think that that is really important what we're seeing is the gentrification by second third fourth generation chinese americans who are exploiting their own people for this and then you have the developers from china and all that and yes you have the artists and and, and the art washing piece of it who are also weaponizing and co-opting our culture right but i do i just wanted to say that uh people who we've reached out to that we think are our friends right are not right because we're not seeing the same we're not seeing things in the same way class-wise right and so we are realizing that building solidarity amongst all kinds of folks across the city other communities of color who are facing the same kind of violence and gentrification um in in these different kind of uh strategies um that that culture developers use culture and art um, has been actually the m most important thing for us. It's yes, in Chinatown, but building yeah. alliances across New York City, so. Mm. I love that discussion of uh, the solidarity and the alliances, Betty. 
uh, and I know firsthand from seeing a lot of that work, uh, what you all are doing with the Chinatown Art Brigade. Um, Candace, uh, this question about um, mm -hmm. how networks of artists can uniquely help build equitable and decolonized communities and why they should feel, why they feel, why you feel they should be engaged in that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll keep it short. And thank you, Betty, also for acknowledging, you know, your work in recognizing the displacement of, of Lenape folks as well, which has been profound. Um, I would say that I do know that there is an active land back coalition working in New York City at the moment. Um, the artists that I mentioned prior New Red Order Collective are, are part of that, um, as well as American Indian Community House. Um, one thing that I want to mention with regards to how to make this actionable is that um, I've learned from Lenape relatives is that, you know, if you want to work towards creating real relations with Lenape folks, cultural workers broadly, you know, artists included, is, you know, work with federally recognized tribes directly. No individual, unless they're authored by authorized by the tribe can represent the tribe. Um, so that's, you know, something to know. I think at the moment there's um, a kind of rush to decolonize and with that uh, certain kinds of economies are produced. Um, but think really carefully about uh, the relations that you're building and think about them long-term and sustainably, always already from the question of, how does my partnership or how can my organization, how does our work together benefit the tribe directly? Not benefit us, not benefit the organization, not be a part of cultural capital, but how does it benefit the tribe directly? So that's one thing. And the last thing that I'll, I will say is that the reason why land back is so important to us and us, I'm also naming artists, is because it's not about property. Land for us is the basis of all of our knowledge and we all know this. It's the basis of our language, it's the basis of ceremony, it's the basis of song. So when you don't have that, you lose access to all of that wealth, not monetary wealth, but cultural wealth. Thank you, Candace. Um, and we, uh, we're about to go to audience questions, but I just wanna, um, someone had asked uh, if Candace, you could restate the name of the group uh, that that uh, uh, lifted up the idea of the territorial acknowledgments instead of land acknowledgments. What's the name their, of that group? Their name is New Red Order. They're a public secret society. You New can Red Order. Wonderful. More about Thank them you. online. Um, okay, let's see. If we can get the questions that have come in from the audience dropped into the chat. And while that's happening, I'm going to cheat this just a little bit to ask uh, Ron and Jolly if you could give brief responses to one last question that I have to ask. So much of the work of empowering community starts with shaping the narrative about who and what is at stake. You've both generated tremendous public support and media coverage for your work. What lessons have you learned about shaping the narrative that can help others who are working to preserve culture and strengthen communities? Briefly, if you can, Ron, any, any uh, big sparks that have, have come to you about shaping the narrative that could be helpful for others? Well, one thing I, I learned, first of all, about the media, they have built you up and tear you down. So don't, don't just count on the media and also understand the power that you have in putting the message out. You know, especially now with social media, we don't really need the media, but we need the media, right? So understanding that we have the power and we can control our own narratives and then the media starts catering to us. And also, I've never been afraid of the media. I mean, I've had the media try to turn me down and some of the people in the media try to turn me down become my friends. And I use those relationships to put the spotlight on issues in my community that help the people in my community. Otherwise, you know, we concentrate on things like bike lanes. You know, in my community, everybody doesn't want bike lanes, for instance, and all the money that we pay from tickets, instead of going in our community to help people who pay the tickets, the parking tickets, and the camera tickets that's going on, it's going to bike lanes and taking away a lot of our culture and businesses that we, you know, we've had for decades. So I would say that one of the most important things with the media is develop relationships with them where you can, but understand that we control the media. If we learn how to control the media, learn how to control the back room, 
And, and that's one thing that I've been able to do, get create relationships with people who I like and with people who I don't like. And I learned that from studying under people who work in the civil rights movement, movement with Martin Luther King. So I just think that we can shape uh, uh, and use the media to benefit our movements and everything that we're doing. And one other thing I wanted to say, um, I was in New York the other day at the Hip Hop Museum, and it was so weird, not weird, but interesting. He had his vision 12 years ago. I had my vision 12 years ago about the Gogo Museum, and he's built, they have an affordable house in which we all want to make sure it's the right thing. But here in D.C., where we're doing the museum, four years from now, we plan on going up and doing artist housing. And we've got to understand that our dreams do not fit into their, their, their formulas. But we got to make it work. And we had to raise money to make it work. So we can have a museum and on top of it, we really have creatives and artists who can, can be there, right, in our community and not be pushed out. So it comes from being strategic, using the media, using these big corporations. Like one of them, I can't say the name because I had to sign a non-disclosure, but they've given me $200,000 to do a, a mobile museum, right? But it's people out here who will help you but we got to make sure that we don't change who we are. The media doesn't change who we are. We keep our culture and we be, and stay visionaries. We are visionaries. And if we believe visionaries can make their dreams come true. Mm. Power. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Uh, ja Jali, briefly, and yeah. then we've got these audience questions popping in. Any lessons that you've learned about shaping the narrative that can help others who are doing this work? Yeah, you know, I think um, the work that, that we're doing with Nueva Yorkinos, we always say that we're just a bridge. We're, we're just here to be the platform. We're just here to make these connections. People who are writing their stories, sharing their stories, sharing their family videos with us, like they're writing their own stories. We're not penning their narratives. We are giving, you know, we are providing a platform for people to talk about the beauty that comes with seeing the first snowfall and the heartbreak that comes with seeing their father deported and the tiredness that comes with walking from Mexico to New York City and the, the you know, style that comes with growing up with a mom who does hair in the salon. But it's people who are, we're telling all of our stories. And I think that there's something very interesting that I've seen recently, and I do think that it's symptomatic of just social media and the narcissism of social media is that, you know, a lot of folks, of course, you know, say that they do community centered work. Oh, it's for the community. Oh, it's for the community. Oh, it's for this. But then it becomes about them. And similar to what Betty was saying about, you know, gentrification as it pertains to artists who are, you know, maybe second gen or in a different social socioeconomic bracket than, you know, the actual community that they're existing in, even if they may look, you know, um, even if they are kinfolk, it doesn't mean that that they are kinfolk, you know? And so yeah. I think that it's very important that if your work is about the community, your work is about the community. If you're, it, whenever you see yourself starting to make it about you, that is when the systems have won. You know, the work that we're doing with Meva Yorkinos, of course, we're proud to be Latino, Black, Indigenous, um, for second gen, first gen, immigrant, third gen uh, communities and, and diasporas, but the work is not about me as an individual or my partner as an individual. The work is about the community. And so as long as that remains as you know the focus of anyone's work that is about community, that is about diaspora, um, then that's a good thing. Again, when it starts to become about you, that's when you realize that you're, you know, you're engaging in like the capitalistic, narcissistic form of, of uh, performative activism and you know, no one needs that. Got anymore. it. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's jump into these questions. I'm going to call on one person to respond to, uh, you know, per question and see if we can answer just as many as possible. Najma, uh, I'd like to take this uh, first one up with you. Uh, interested in other panelists' thoughts on actualizing reparations, including education and acknowledgement of racism. Najma, any thoughts there? I mean, rep uh, I guess rep um, reparations... The conversation is interesting because it's like they're not like I would say the government and people are just not ready to pay the money that is actually um, what it is going to cost to give us actual reparations. So um, I've been in this conversation many times, but do I think it's going to happen? I don't <laughs> like necessarily not in, like I'm not going to like I'm going to be really honest. I just don't think it is. But I think um, it will happen in levels. You know what I mean? 
Um, so personally, I would just say um, when it comes to education, um, I don't see an acknowledgement of racism because we're sitting here now talking about critical race theory. We're sitting here like literally um, from a systemic place, we're literally eliminating the ideas of racism in schools. We're, we're, we're literally burning books right now in 2023. So in general, I, I, I just don't see it happening at this time. I, I, I see the conversation still being pushed forward. I see, you know, groups coming together to, to um, still push, like give a lot of pushback to fight this. But I think there's, there's a lot more that has to happen first before we get to that point. Thank you. Thank you, Najma. Betty, I want to take this next question to you, and I want to tweak the question a little bit uh, with respect to the viewer who posed it. The question is, please address collective next steps. How will this group work together for sustainable change? I, I want to tweak that a little bit to ask you, Betty, how can everyone who's concerned about these things work together for sustainable change? The first thing, um, thank you for the, reframing the question. I, I think that the first thing we have to acknowledge is that art and culture alone will not um, mean a whole lot if it's not a part of larger, uh, broader social justice, social change movements for economic, racial um, um, justice, right? And so we, I think we've been talking about that in different ways. What, what does that look like? Um, so um, I just want to acknowledge at Chinatown Art Brigade, you know, our work as a collective, our work is only as powerful as the actual work on the ground to really prevent the day-to-day -day displacement of, of, of immigrant tenants in Chinatown, and then also trying to help push policies that will prevent, um, we don't want to just prevent the bleeding, right? We want to really get to the structural piece of it, right? So to to pass policies that will really protect folks in Chinatown, the small businesses, um, and the um, also the the Latino and the the Latinx and the Chinatown part of of the community of Lower Manhattan. So there's a, a bunch of policies that community groups have put together um, that has been in existence for ten years now. It's called the Chinatown Working Group Plan. Anyway, um, you know, the mayor that has to get through city council and then the mayor. Right. Um, and so I'm not sure about this mayor in New York City right now, but it's those are tools to actually talk to people. And something that uh, Ron, Ron said that was really powerful, which is that um, they've won when when we feel like we've lost the power. Right. Because they are brainwashing us to think, well, you as individuals have no power. But the whole point for us as artists is to use art as a catalyst for change and to like use art. We know as artists that we can actually animate what's possible, right? Like the future, right? And what, what's what's happening in the present and then animate what's possible in the future. And so we use ourselves as vessels, as tools um, in the work, in the movement um, to really provide that platform for storytelling, right? For people to tell their own stories. And I think that um, in that way, for me, um, you know, both as artists, um, understanding our role, right? It's not the end all be all. We art and, and media and culture is a tool not an end goal um that we have to embed ourselves in these larger social change movements um and so i say that to say that um how do we sustain ourselves is to make sure we keep ourselves in check why are we doing this work who are we here to serve and it's not just in the public interest interest in general but it's right. in the interest of po folks who made the communities what they are and to make sure that they get to stay in the communities that they made home so that's kind of Right. That's my answer, I think. <laughs> that's yeah, that's super helpful, Betty. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we have uh, five minutes. Let's see if we can go through these next questions quickly. Uh, Ron, I'm going to put this one to you. Uh, the thing is, art brings new resources and people into communities. How do you manage to do that without displacing and alienating the existing community? What are the strategies for inclusion? Ron, brief response. I think when the when it's done by the grassroots, of course, the grassroots are going to keep the grassroots there. The problem is we always have people come off from a UFO in our communities like they coming to save us instead of us saving us. So as long as the community is a part of it, then that doesn't happen. The problem is, you know, the pe the very same people who say that they're here to stop gentrification. I tell you, in D.C., on one side of town, they start off just like us build these multi-million dollar nonprofits, sell it 20 years later, cash in on the gentrification. Then they come to Southeast, buy up all the property, 
Then they push all the small nonprofits out, tell those small nonprofits to come work for them, but then they the same people that criticize Amazon. I just don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me, same. right? So, I mean, that's what we're dealing with. I'm just saying. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Candace, uh, briefly want to ask you this question. Uh, how do you integrate old and new community to create something that works for both? Yeah, it's a, it's a nice question. Um, well, I'll give an answer that will seem a little far away. And that is that in my home community in, in Car Cross, which is in the Yukon, Canada, it's short for Caribou Crossing. The Caribou used to cross there until 100,000 white prospectors came to our region. And, you know, the Caribou are pretty sensitive to that, so they moved. Um, one thing that we initiated when we started... Uh, um, let's say like calling it a cultural reinvestment um, scheme, it could be a scheme, a good one, let's say a good one, was that um, we realized right away um, that in the creation of our village centers now ca called Car Cross Commons, it's quite literally a commons, it even has pop-up shops in the summer where folks make jewelry, like the earrings that I'm wearing. And a portion of those sales are go back into the community. It's really a kind of potlatch ethos. Um, so we receive a small amount of those proceeds by like an annual check every year. Um, but that was a really new idea. And when Car Cross Commons came, you know, into fruition, people were concerned. So what did the leaders in our communities do? Uh, the clan leaders, as well as our elected leader, um, they decided that they needed to find a way to bring youth and elders together. So quite literally the old and the new. We have still a um, housing crisis, so there's not enough houses for all the folks who want to live in our community. Um, so they started a small homes initiative. And who built the small homes? Youth. And they were trained as tradespeople. Who were the homes for? They were for elders. So thinking about who benefits and how you center those folks and how you center intergenerational relations, very, very specifically, very, very deliberately. Right, right, thank you. Okay, last question. Jolly, uh, gonna turn it to you for a lightning response. Yes. Why have gentrifying creatives ignored the creative businesses and institutions that are already established and in place? Why do they feel the need to ignore and isolate these institutions in order to create space for themselves in a community that they are joining? One minute Be response, please. Yes, because it's easier to center yourself. And it is the narcissistic thing that, or the narcissistic air and atmosphere environment that has always come with colonialism. It's the, I came, I saw, I conquer. You know, there, I mean, art washing, that's a whole other segment that we should all have. And I would love to be in conversation with everyone about that. But, you know, so much of gentrification in New York City, um, and I'm sure in other parts of the country, is started by art, art scenes, art, you know, artists who move to, you know, affordable neighborhoods, who, you know, create art galleries that only exhibit artists that are part of their gentrifying, you know, circles. I see this all the time, Bushwick, again, Washington Heights. I see it in Chinatown as well. And I think that, you know, it's just, it's one of those things that when you call a gentrifier out, that's one thing they do not want to be called. I'm not a gentrifier. It's the same people mm -hmm. who, you know, march mm -hmm. down with signs that say Black Lives Matter, who have displaced, you know, generations of Black homeowners in bed and Clinton Hill. It's the same people who say that they are here as allies, but then refuse to support businesses that are existing, you know? And so it just, gentrification is hyper-narcissism. Got it. Thank you. That's going to be our closing note. I want to say thank you so much, panel, for that dynamic conversation. Clearly, we could have talked for another hour. And thank you, Laura Ortman, for that powerful performance at the top. Oh, my gosh. On behalf of everyone here at the WNET group, a big thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Please come back next Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern, for The Bigger Picture, a town hall about journalism and housing narratives. Learn more at 13.org slash close to home. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. We'll see you in a week.